So now that we've gone through an overview of the central nervous system, we'll shift gears by looking at the other side of complex vertebrate nervous systems, and that is the peripheral nervous system. So a true nervous system will, of course, contain a brain and a spinal cord, and we saw how complex that can be just by looking at the spinal cord. More on the brain later. Now let's take a look at the complexity associated with the peripheral nervous system by entitling this next flowchart PNS1. As we go through the peripheral nervous system, be sure to take a look at figure 49.8. It gives you a good structural understanding and visual representation of this part of the nervous system. So, the peripheral nervous system is the other half of a true nervous system, of a complex nervous system seen in many vertebrates. The purpose of the peripheral nervous system is the following. Its job is to transmit info, that's any sort of information that the body recognizes, to and from the central nervous system. That's why it's peripheral. It's on the sides of the nervous system. It's the side nervous system that detects information um, that's coming from the environment and sends it to the central nervous system. And the central nervous system has to respond, and that response will be sort of propagated by the peripheral nervous system. Let's take a look at that idea in more detail now. The peripheral nervous system, through this function, is going to have the following composition. These are the things that make up the peripheral nervous system and allow it to function in the way that we've highlighted. The composition contains sensory receptors. So we know what these are. These are very important initial sort of parts of any sort of impulse or message being sent to the brain because sensory receptors are going to be those that detect stimuli. Whether that is a mechanoreceptor, a chemoreceptor, a baroreceptor, whatever it may be, all of those things detect stimuli and they're going to send that information to the brain for interpretation. And in addition, for this sending to the brain to happen and for the brain to respond, the peripheral nervous system must therefore contain various nerves. The nerves are going to be basically arranged in two subsets. The peripheral nervous system will contain cranial nerves and will also contain spinal nerves. Let's look at cranial first. Cranial nerves are going to be those that come and originate from the hind part, so the back, the hind part of brain, that's the central nervous system. So these are nerves that are originally at this part of the central nervous system, but then they go forward and out of the central nervous system by innervating. Okay, the term here is innervate. So they take these nerves and put themselves into the head and also the upper body of the vertebrate in question. So these are, let's look at this one more time, cranial nerves are those that start at the hind part of the brain. So they start in the central nervous system area, but then they're going to innervate and go towards the head and upper body and control that part peripherally. Spinal nerves are going to do the following. They originate, of course, from the spinal cord. So let's write that down. From the spinal cord, again, similarity here is that they both originate, spinal and cranial, at a central nervous system structure, but they propagate themselves and spread themselves out like this. So they fr they're from the spinal cord, and then the spinal nerves are going to actually innervate. They're going to send nerves to the entire body, not just the head or upper region, but the rest of the body all the way down to your toes, all the way to your knee, whatever it may be. That's going to be the job of the spinal nerves that are originating from the spinal cord. So in order to understand this composition, I would take a look at figure 49.6 to get an idea of just how this innervation, that's the term that we're using here, happens throughout the body. So that's our basic composition of the peripheral nervous system. These are the things that make it up. But we can organize these things in a much more understandable form. And that's by splitting the peripheral nervous system into two components. So let's write that here. The peripheral nervous system is generally seen as two functioning components, two overall, let's say, arms of the peripheral nervous system. So there's two components here that we have to focus on. The first one is known as the afferent sensory component. Afferent sensory. So again, the terminology is important here. This is afferent and starts with an A. And the other component is the efferent component. And that would actually be termed as the efferent motor system. Two very different parts 
of the same overall peripheral nervous system. Notice that this begins with an E, this begins with an A. We've talked about this distinction before. Let's continue to highlight it. The afferent sensory component of the peripheral nervous system is going to be the one that sends information, that finds information, or figures out information, and sends it towards. It is going towards the central nervous system via and from these things that we've talked about before, the composition component known as sensory receptors. So sensory receptors detect stimuli, stimuli, that information is sent to the central nervous system via the peripheral nervous system. What part of it? Via the afferent sensory part of the peripheral nervous system. That's how we send information to the brain, to the spinal cord. So the afferent sensory part of the peripheral nervous system will actually contain two subcomponents. And those two subcomponents are the following. There will also be a visceral component to the afferent sensory part of the peripheral nervous system. And in addition, there will also be a somatic component. Somatic component. So let's take a look at the distinction here. The visceral component of the afferent sensory peripheral nervous system is going to understand and interpret and sense internal environment. Internal environment information. It will be sensed by sensory receptors in the internal environment of the organism. That information will be sent to the CNS. So let's take a look. Internal environment info sent to CNS. This is basically going to be information that we are pretty much unaware of. We are not conscious of this information being sent to the central nervous system because it's internal. Okay, More on this idea in a little bit. The somatic component is a little bit different. This is actually going to contain external, external environment info. That's going to be, of course, as a part of the sen afferent sensory system, will be sent to the CNS. The whole job of afferent, afferent is always about sending information to the CNS, but we can send information in two basic ways, either internal information via visceral component or external information from the environment via the somatic component. And this is going to be very much things that we are pretty much always aware of. Think of this as like you touching some sort of surface and you feeling that it's soft, rough, whatever it may be. That's going to be an external environment information. Soft, rough, that's the touch that you're doing that's being sent to your brain to be interpreted via this afferent sensory arm of the peripheral nervous system. The visceral component, you're not really aware of what's happening on the inside of you and what information is being sent or not being sent to the central nervous system. Therefore, we consider this very much an unaware part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, let's go to the efferent side, the efferent motor system. Notice the big difference here. The second word is very big here, the motor versus sensory. Afferent sensory is all about sensing things. Efferent motor is all about doing things. It's all about responding. And that's why it's the other side of the peripheral nervous system. We can broadly state that the efferent motor system is going to be where we have information that is moving away, not towards, but away from that central nervous system to effectors. The efferent motor system has effectors that will produce effects that are all because information is moving away from the central nervous system. There are two subcomponents of this component as well. Those will be the autonomic nervous system, which we'll actually highlight more in the next flowchart. We'll just state that it's here. The next flowchart will be all about talking about this system. And then there will also be a subcomponent known as the motor system of the efferent motor system. Okay, so that's part of the name. Let's see why it's important. Here what we notice in the efferent motor system, this arm of it, these are going to involve efferent neurons, neurons that are going away or towards the brain. Of course, away from the brain, efferent. Efferent neurons that are going specifically to things that move, things that cause a response in terms of function that's all about movement. And we talked about this before. These are going to be muscles, specifically muscles you are in control of. Efferent neurons that are going to go to voluntary muscles, aka skeletal muscles. That's what the motor system of this part of the peripheral nervous system is about. 
efferent neurons to skeletal muscles. Why skeletal muscles? Well, this is the part of the peripheral nervous system that involves very much conscious control, conscious control of actions. This is what allows you to do something that you want to do, like stand up, sit down, walk, whatever it may be. It's all via information being sent from the brain telling you to do that action and then actually doing that action. How? Because of the efferent neurons that are moving away from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscles necessary to stand, necessary to walk, necessary to sit, whatever it may be. So that's conscious, all of this. And in addition, this is going to be the part of the peripheral nervous system that also controls and is very much involved in the spinal cord reflexes. Now, why is that? You might be wondering, well, why are we mentioning spinal cord reflexes? I thought that was central nervous system. Remember, the spinal cord reflexes involve muscles. Remember the quad muscle, the hamstring muscle? All of those things are going to happen as a result of information moving away from the central nervous system, moving away from the spinal cord that's still part of the central nervous system towards an effector. The effector in our knee-jerk reflex was what? the quads and the hamstrings, either to contract or relax. And that's the idea of a conscious control, and not conscious control specifically, I should say, but the idea of a motor action occurring, even if it's unconscious, based off of the motor system. So now, in the next flowchart, we'll look at the autonomic nervous system in more detail. This covers our first look at the peripheral nervous system.